Brickyard 44, 67, wind 200 at 10, runway 31 left at Kilo Echo, clear for takeoff. The year is 1917. The world is at war. The United States had joined the Allies of the First World War earlier in the year. Canada had been involved for over three years. The Atlantic was a war zone terrorized by Germany's U-boats, which had already sunk thousands of civilian ships and killed over 10,000 crew and passengers. The sinking of the Lusitania, which had occurred two years earlier, resulted in 1,200 deaths alone. Halifax was a strategic port for the Allies during World War I. Supplies and troops would congregate in the city to board ships for Europe. Hospital ships would bring the wounded back to North America via Halifax. Because of its importance in the Allied war effort, Halifax was a potential military target and the city took precautions. A strict blackout was ordered throughout the city, requiring lights to be turned out or covered between one hour after sunset and one hour before sunrise. Those who failed to comply could be fined up to $5,000, more than $80,000 in 2019. More relevant to the story, anti-submarine nets were cast across the harbor's entrance from dusk to dawn to protect the harbor and its ships from Germany's U-boats. The anti-submarine nets in Halifax brought two ships together in December 1917. On the night of December 5th, a small Norwegian ship of 5,000 tons was in Halifax Harbor. This ship was the Emo, and she had been chartered by the Belgian Relief Commission and was supposed to sail for New York to take on relief supplies for this purpose. Emo needed to take on coal, but the order her captain had placed was not delivered until the evening, when the anti-submarine nets had already been cast. Emo would not be able to leave that night, but the pilot agreed to stay on board so the ship could depart first thing in the morning. Stuck on the other side of the net, at the opposite end of the harbor, a small ship had arrived at Halifax a day early, but too late to enter the harbor, again due to anti-submarine nets. This ship was the Mont Blanc, a 3,000-ton French tramp steamer, and had been chartered to carry a cargo of various explosives from New York to France. The cargo was 2,325 tons of picric acid, 225 tons of TNT, 10 tons of gun cotton, and 35 tons of benzol, illegally stored in drums up on deck. Given the ship's cargo, her crew was anxious about being stuck outside of the harbor in potentially hostile waters. In order to signal to other ships that she was carrying explosives, Mont Blanc was supposed to be flying a red flag, but this would potentially have made her a target for the Germans, and so her captain decided against it. This would be a potential contributing factor to a catastrophic event which would occur the next day. So, at 7.30 the next morning, the crew of the Mont Blanc raised anchor and headed into the then open harbor. She made way for Bedford Basin at the far end of the harbor, traveling at about four knots. At eight o'clock, the Emo raised anchor from Bedford Basin and headed down the long Halifax Harbor. The delayed ship was hurrying along at about seven knots. Since Emo was bound for New York to pick up her cargo, she was more or less empty and was sitting high in the water, significantly reducing the submerged surface area of her rudder. This, of course, made her less maneuverable than usual. Both ships, the Mont Blanc and the Emo, entered the constrained midsection of Halifax Harbor at about the same time. This area is called the Narrows, and is only about 1,500 feet wide. The Narrows is hazardous because all the inbound and outbound ships using the busy port of Halifax have to pass through it. The general rule of navigating the channel is to keep right. In other words, stay in your lane and collisions can be avoided. Before we get further into this video, I want to remind you to hit the subscribe button. If you're interested in transportation, history, or both, you'll want to know when a new video is posted. If you have something to say, make sure you leave a comment below. Okay. Back to the video. Navigation, though, doesn't happen in a vacuum, and things do not always go according to plan, even when ships are controlled by local pilots who are experts in their harbors. Another small ship cut across Emo's path, resulting in a decision by the pilot to veer to port into the wrong lane. This put her in the path of inbound traffic. While traveling on the wrong side of the Narrows, Emo is confronted by another vessel, an inbound tugboat. To avoid a collision, the Emo and the tugboat pass each other on the wrong side. The tugboat was between Emo and her correct lane. Emo was temporarily stuck. Now, Mont Blanc is sailing directly for the speeding, trapped, and less maneuverable Emo. On a clear collision course, both ships could stop and reverse their engines, but they didn't. The pilot of Mont Blanc, Francis Mackey, signaled with one blast of the horn that they had the right of way and would maintain course. Emo's pilot, William Hayes, responded with two sounds of the horn, indicating that they too would maintain course. 
Finally, Francis Mackey did stop the engine and turned to port in an attempt to avoid a collision. Emo too decides at the last moment to reverse her engines. But because Emo had a single screw, the torque of the propeller spinning in reverse caused the bow to turn to the right. Emo collided with Mont Blanc, slicing a hole in her hull and knocking over explosive cargo, including the drums of Benzol on deck. The grinding of the two ships' hulls created sparks which started a fire aboard the Mont Blanc as the two ships drifted apart. Captain Lemedic of the Mont Blanc immediately recognizes the danger his ship is in and orders his crew to abandon ship. They take to the lifeboats and row hard to the shores of Dartmouth. On shore in Halifax, people started to notice what was going on. People peered out their windows and crowds gathered on docks. The abandoned Mont Blanc drifted westward and eventually crashed into Pier 6 in Halifax's north end. The ship burned against the pier as crowds continued to build. Some recognized the danger of the situation and fled. One of these people was a local railway dispatcher named Vincent Coleman. Vince Coleman was stationed near Pier 6 and saw the writing on the wall when he realized the ship burning below was carrying explosives. He and others at his location fled on foot, but Vince remembered that a train filled with passengers was approaching the city and was scheduled to arrive at any minute. He ran back to his post to send a message to the inbound train warning them of the impending disaster. Hold up the train. Ammunition ship afire in harbor making for Pier 6 and will explode. Guess this will be my last message. Goodbye, boys. This would in fact be Vince Coleman's last message. At 9.04 and 35 seconds, the Mont Blanc exploded. Everything within half a mile of the Mont Blanc at the time of the explosion was completely destroyed. Anything within a mile was devastated. The explosion spawned a tsunami, which reached 60 feet above the high water mark and took out 1,600 buildings. The shockwave and destruction killed 1,600 people instantly and wounded 9,000. The same shockwave pushed trees to the ground and toppled buildings throughout northern Halifax and Dartmouth. At the core of the explosion, the temperature was 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, vaporizing the water around it and disintegrating the Mont Blanc itself. Mont Blanc's anchor soared over the city and crashed to the ground two and a half miles to the southwest. Her cannon launched over the harbor and landed two miles away. Windows as far as 60 miles away from Halifax were shattered, and the shockwave could be felt as far away as Yarmouth, St. John, and Cape Breton. In an instant, the city of Halifax was in a state of ruins that foreshadowed the state of Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the detonation of the atomic bombs. 6,000 people lucky enough to survive were suddenly homeless. A problem quickly exacerbated later that night by an unexpected blizzard which dropped 16 inches of snow on the ruins of Halifax and brought wind chills of 5 degrees Fahrenheit. The response to the explosion is a testament to the goodwill of humanity. People from all over came to the aid of Halifax. George Graham, a Boston banker working in Halifax, sent a telegraph to J.J. Phelan in Boston. Organize a relief train and send word to Wolfville and Windsor to round up all doctors, nurses, and Red Cross supplies possible to obtain. Not time to explain details, but list of casualties is enormous. The Boston and Maine Railroad agreed to supply a train if it could be filled. Harvard Medical School sent all its staff. Doctors, nurses, supplies, and volunteers were loaded onto the train for Halifax. Shipments of furniture, food, and lumber followed the train of volunteers. Homelessness persisted for months, and the period of rebuilding would continue for years to come. A year after the explosion, Halifax sent one of their famous Christmas trees to Boston to thank them for their immediate aid. The token of thanks was revived in 1971, and every year since, the Nova Scotia Department of National Resources has delivered a Christmas tree to Boston. Today, Halifax is a thriving city of 400,000. In 2018, Halifax Transit named its new ferry after Vincent Coleman, the beloved local hero of the catastrophe that reshaped a city.